Well, um, I got into business because I was a funny kid in high school, an outcast, you know, and uh, a weirdo. And, uh, never and grew out of it, right? Uh, ne <laughs> never, never, never. Uh, and, uh, no, I started doing stand-up, and I worked uh, a, a lot of stand-up in uh, New York and San Francisco. I worked with Barbara Streisand and various people, and, uh, and from there I got a Broadway show, which was Bye Bye Birdie, and uh, that kind of put me on the map as an actor, and I got nominated for a Tony Award and all that sort of thing, and that opened up uh, motion pictures and television. So a lot of the people uh, knew me from television, but they didn't know that I did voices and things. And uh, those I did in my, in my nightclub act. So I, I pulled them out, you know, when, when uh, I started doing uh, that, and I, and I made a tape. Now the thing is, you'd think I would have an edge because they knew me as an actor, but I really didn't. I had to prove myself, like everyone has to prove themselves. And one of the problems I, I find in making a tape, it used to be okay, but now with the engineers and what they can do, they can make you sound like you're doing a, a multiple voices and you don't really have to do anything. So it's gotta be a clean track without a lot of fancy, fancy cuts and editing and, and, and no tricks from the engineer, so they know that you can really do those, because they might challenge you on it, which is what they did to me. They called me into Hanna-Barbera, and they said, okay, I want you to read this story. And they gave me a story to read, cold. And while I was reading it, they said, okay, now what if a Russian was reading it? So I heard the, the accents as I was speaking, and they said, now what if he's older? I said, oh, if he's older, then he's like this. And what if he's younger? Okay. And you have to be able to very quickly go from one voice to the other, like you're arguing with yourself successfully, you know? And, uh, and they really put you through it, man. So, you know, you've got to be ready. You've got to uh, have it in your head the voices you do that are successful, you know, you've tried out on your friends and stuff, and, uh, and you take those sounds and those voices and you write yourself a script. Now, it could be the Three Little Bears, I, I don't care what it is. And you take this script and you rehearse it and you rehearse it and you get it down and you know which characters are which, so they, if they throw you a curve, you're gonna be able to deal with it. And that's what they want, someone who can deliver on the spot and deliver professionally without any problems. Do you think that's fair, Jack? I, I don't recognize any of that. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said before about sexually available, that's how Jack got in. <laughs> is it my turn in the barrel? I think it is. Oh. <laughs> well, I was always a good joke chiller when I was a kid. And I could make my mother laugh. And when you can make the goddess of everything laugh, you know, she's less likely to take a swing at you. And uh, I would, as I got older, I would tell off-color jokes to my mother, and she would, oh, Jackie, you're, you're awful. <laughs> and, but she still laughed. So that was good. And so I, I, I got in the habit of, make, you know, telling jokes. And... And then a, a, a production company came to, I lived in Berkeley, California. A production company came to town. I, I was like maybe 10 or 11 years old, and they were looking for 12-year-old boys to uh, be in a movie. And my mother sent my older brother, and she sent me to accompany him. And he didn't want to do it, and I did. <laughs> but I wasn't old enough. And, uh, and I said, damn, and I, I always kind of, kicked myself in the butt for not going and lying about my age. Uh, but uh, later on, uh, I, I decided I wanted to go to Hollywood and be a movie star. And I was going with this girlfriend, uh, Lynn McTavish. Oh, she was great. And Lynn McTavish, <laughs> <laughs> that's what everybody said. I, I never, I didn't get it, but. Uh, <laughs> 
But as I'm graduating from high school, her mother said, well, now that you're getting out of high school, what are you going to do with yourself? And I said, I'm going to go to Hollywood and become a movie star. Said, oh, God, you can't do that. That takes somebody special. Or to get real. What's the matter with you? And, and I thought, ooh, that's a bad thing to say. So I quit telling people. And I just, I, I sent my money home. I was going to go to the Pasadena Playhouse and become a movie star. And I sent money home for my, I was in the Army. Sent money home to, for my mother to take care of, to put it in the bank for me. And when I got home, I asked where the money was. And she said, oh, I'm sorry, honey. I had to spend it. And I'll put pay you back. I said, Mom, you have no talent and no job and no <laughs> prospects. How are you going to pay it back? Well, I meant well. Uh, OK. So I went to San Francisco State and uh, majored in radio and television. And this was in like 1955, 56. And the state of television was so in its infancy. And what they were teaching at San Francisco State was uh, for television, they had a black box with a toilet roll painted black on the front. With, and it was on three legs. And that was what they had as a television camera. And, and <laughs> <laughs> Sounds painful. <laughs> so, so it kind of looked like McDavish. <laughs> what, what they were teaching was how to move the cameras in a two-camera oh. show so you didn't trip oh. over the wires and stuff. Yeah. So we did that. And, uh, uh, and then the radio sh the radio was in a state of flux as well. Instead of doing Lone Ranger episodes, the radio was transitioning into disc jockeys and what we have pretty much today. Uh, and, uh, but San Francisco State was still teaching Lone Ranger episodes. And when they did teach disc jockey stuff, they had some guy play queuing up the records, and they had a script girl, and they had a director, and they had all the... When I broke into radio, I had to do it all. And, uh, uh, you know, besides sweeping up and pulling the news off the news wire and rewriting it and doing all, I mean, everything. And uh, it was devastating to realize that that's what I was going to have to do. Well, I mean, after a while, you get to you figure out what to do. But So I did radio for 18 years. And that was like stealing because I'd go in and do a three-hour show and tell jokes, play music I liked, uh, and get paid for it. You know? And people would complain about their working hours. And I'd say, yeah, boy, I agree. I had to go three hours straight through with no lunch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that, that always shuts them up. You know? So uh, going from radio, I transitioned into when I finally got to LA uh, to uh, in, in, in discover Wally Bird discovered me, and I discovered Wally. And uh, Wally was the director of a lot of cartoons. And that started me on the road to doing cartoons, and we just never have stopped. Venus? Mm, my turn. Um, hi, everybody. Um, how to get into voice acting? I sort of just fell into it. I had a friend in Vancouver. Uh, his roommate was a producer, and she had her own production company. And he said to me, he says, hey, he says, you know, you're, you're here to, you know, kind of pursue your career. And uh, he says, why don't you um, do some, you know, voice acting? And I said, voice acting? And I had really no idea what that was because I had trained in theater and uh, film and television. So I thought, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to meet with her and, and see what this is all about. So her name is Josanne Lovick, and she is one of the executive producers that did the show Andromeda. Uh, but this was before Andromeda uh, came to life. She uh, had a meeting with me. She let me listen to a voice demo of one of the male actors uh, from Vancouver. So I listened to it, and I thought, oh, this is kind of cool. I can do that, because you know, we all goof around with voices and come up with little you know, characters uh, at home, especially in the privacy of our own home or with our friends and stuff. And I thought, oh, yeah, maybe I'll give this a shot. And so I... Um, didn't really go to a studio or anything like that. I did uh, what you mentioned. I um, came up with a little short story. So I had a few of my characters that I do well taking a flight to Venus because I thought, oh, that would be cool because that's my name and maybe they'll remember me that way and if it's good enough. So I had like the flight attendant, the grandmother, the little girl, the little boy, and, and, an, and an evil character as well. Um, so put that together and uh, submitted it to a couple of the studios. And when they brought their first cartoon into Vancouver, um, Captain N, um, the Game Master, and it was actually the first cartoon uh, in Vancouver, and it was to promote the um, Nintendo machines when they first came out. 
So I played the role of Princess Lana, and it kind of just snowballed from there for me. Um, also, I was very fortunate to work with um, one of the top um, voice directors from Los Angeles, Sue Blue. And she, I mean, she Sue has Blue. Sue Blue. Yeah. Sue Blue. And sure. she has, uh, you know, she was amazing. She kind of helped uh, not only myself, but all the other male actors that I worked with. Um, oh, and that she have, wrote a book, didn't she? And she, yes, yeah, she also wrote a book. book. Yeah. Really good book. Yeah, really good book of how to get into voice acting and, and what you need to do. And, and she kind of just kind of paved the, the path for us and showed us, you know, what, what to do and little tricks and, and, you know, how to position the mic and, you know, um, and all that stuff. And, and ultimately, to be able to come up with the character and also bring in the movement and all that uh, and all the, the the emotion but without any movement because you are in a studio and the mic picks up everything so even that was was kind of fun and, and kind of interesting to learn but it was basically yeah it was Sue and and all the shows that started coming into Vancouver that kind of sh paved the way for us and and we learned as we went along so we, it, for us it was we didn't even know what we were really getting ourselves into um not to mention how huge it is and, and, and how, what a following most of these shows have, you know. So I got to do a lot of those shows and do a Japanese anime as well, which is a little different than the prelay stuff. When you're in the studio doing prelay, that means the characters haven't been drawn yet. That means that you have, you, your acting ability comes in and you're able to play with the character and, and come up with, you know, some cool ways to, to say the line or to interact with the other actors. Whereas um, ADR, which has uh, obviously been recorded in Japan or other countries and brought to Canada or the U.S. to dub in English, um, you don't really have that much leeway. You really have to make the lines fit, like the, the dialogue of the character fit uh, the character's uh, mouth movements. So that's interesting too, and that's also a learning curve. And, and there's two different ways to do it. Back in the day, we used to do it with the three beeps you ha in your headset. You'd hear the three beeps, and as soon as the beep stopped, you'd start talking as soon as the um, character would open its mouth. And there was also the line uh, we used to do where you're in a studio and you've got this big screen and you see a line and as soon as it crosses and it ends, then you begin speaking. So that was another way that we dubbed shows as well. Um, I think for, for most people, uh, especially if you love this type of industry or you're, you're trying to break in, I think it's important to maybe take some classes and not only voice classes, I think it's important to take some acting classes because it helps you yeah. figure out how to build a character. Um, it gives you confidence. It builds, you know, just, just knowledge. I think knowledge is power in anything that you do and the more you read up on it or the more, you know, you, you surf on the web to figure out, you know, how, how the best way to get into it and what works for you would be a good thing. Also, you know, maybe um, hook up with a studio that you have uh, near your home that you can um, maybe go in and make a deal with one of the, uh, you know, technicians in there and say, hey, can we, can, you know, I'm interested in doing a voice tape, you know, how much would it cost me? Because it can be expensive um, renting studio time as well. So something, something to definitely do your research and maybe practice a little bit at home on your recorder or everyone has iPhones now that have like voice recorders. You can practice your voices on that. You know, but these days, people can make their own tapes at home, mm -hmm. and I always advise you to do that uh, because, you know, no sooner do you make a tape than you do a job and you get another piece of material that is so great you want to put it on your tape, and you've just spent $1,000 making a tape, and, uh, and then how do you get that in there? So if you learn to do it yourself, and now the editing material in your computers is so terrific, uh, and the microphones are so great, that you can, you can make a home studio for very few bucks and you can make your own demo tape. And, and mm -hmm. if you have any ideas of, of how a demo tape should be made, uh, go to my agent's website. It's arlenethornton.com and click on animation and listen to the voices and see how the tapes are made. They're short, little short pieces that ha one has no relation to the other. Uh, they, they sound like they, they've come out of various cartoons, if we're talking about animation. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and just 10 or ten seconds, 15 seconds maximum, string those things together, and uh, you've, got a, you've, you've got a nice little demo tape. Uh, but you, you were talking about Susan Blue. She used to be uh, also, uh, she had a casting service in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. 
and she did a lot of casting. And Susan always wanted to, you know, not hurt anybody's feelings, so they would audition, and she'd say, oh, God, that was wonderful. That was really great. <laughs> Very <laughs> positive. These people would come back to the agency and say, I think I got this one. <laughs> everybody, everybody said that. She said it to everyone. Sweet, sweet little girl. But Venus made a great point, which is, you know, a lot of people that I've talked to, and they, and they ask me about, about voiceover, and they don't think it's acting. A lot of people don't. They think, oh, I'm going to do a voiceover, but I don't have to learn how to act. And you really do ha know how, have to know how to do that. Yeah. And Andrea Romano, who is the casting director for Warner Brothers Animation, yeah. goes to uh, workshops and, and, and talks to the kids. And uh, she said, I don't care how good you can do a voice. If you can't act, don't come to see me mm -hmm. because I need actors who can do voices, not somebody who just can do a voice. And, um, you know, Venus made a good point, you know, she did a thing about, about her name is Venus and she did a story about traveling to Venus. I couldn't do that because my name is Dick. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Dick. <laughs> But, but do you guys have any questions that you, you'd like to pose? Oh, and, so and maybe one of us can come up with something that would work for you. Anyone? Yeah. Probably the easiest way to do this would be if people came up to the mic. <laughs> like you were doing. Yes. Uh, thank you for coming, first of all. It's a pleasure to meet you for the first time. Um, my question is for you, Richard. Yes, sir. Dick. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you played one of my favorite characters in, in G.I. Joe, and it was Serpentor. Yes. Were you told to play it over the top every time? Yes. In fact, what we did is we defined Serpentor as a really bad Shakespearean actor. <laughs> <laughs> really. And he said, that's the way I want you to play it. So if I went, this I command, it was like really hokey, <laughs> you know. And but that's what they wanted. Hmm. And um, no, so that's really his style of acting, anyway. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I did that on Love Boat, and they fired me. Oh <laughs> but, no! <laughs> uh, but but really, no, I, no, I was directed that way, and and, and the bigger the better. In fact, uh, it was Wally Burr who directed me. For, for the movie, and uh, I had to do it all in one day, and I screamed so much at Serpentor that I lost my voice for like a week or so. Mm. The, the other thing I was gonna ask is like, you had such a good back and forth with um, Chris Lada. Um, when you oh yeah, did so oh he was great. Did you find that you played off better when you're all in the same Room. Room as opposed to doing it like oh, a absolute. ADV type. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, you, you get energy from the other mm -hmm. actor and you can react to, and you're really reacting instead of saying, okay, now he said so-and-so, now I have to react, you know. No, it's, it, it's much better and you have a, a, a better f performance and more honest performance mm -hmm. that way. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, did you ever try and throw everybody off of their game anytime you guys were in the same room. Oh, we did it all the time. Didn't yeah, we? <laughs> all, the, all the time. Yeah. No, we, we honestly had fun. And sometimes we would, uh, we would hang up things just by, uh, hang up, you know, the, uh, the festivities just by, by kidding around. But then they say, oh, okay, let's get back to it. In fact, we had a director at Hanna-Barbera and whenever we, we uh, uh, we screwed around. Oh, he'd, oh uh, if he couldn't understand us, he would say, further clarity, <laughs> further clarity. And from then it became, let's do one more for Father Clarity. <laughs> <laughs> it became Father Clarity. So uh, whenever he lapsed into a, an Irish accent, we said, oh, okay, we gotta do it again. Because sometimes you just don't articulate enough, you know. Mm. Thank you. Sure. Sit down. I have a question. 
<laughs> I have a question for you, um, Venus Tarzo. Yeah. How did you come up with the voice for Black Arachnia? I grew up watching Beast Wars, and I've always loved that voice. Oh, cool. Um, it, it, it really has to... It's not something I made up. It's just something that I can do, mm -hmm. I think. And I think that uh, some people have a, a much bigger range than I do. Um, but we, when I went in for the audition, um, the producer and director were there. So that was the difference, that you get to uh, play with your voice a little bit. And they'll say, OK, you know, try it a little bit this way. They give you some direction, so you kind of know where to go. A lot of the times, you do come up with something specific, because when you read the character description, it kind of gives you an idea of, OK, this is you know, who this character is at the moment, and, and what can I do? Like, how can I you know, manipulate my voice to, to, to come up with you know, that particular voice for that character? So it's, it was just working with the director. and, and Really, you know, um, not really caring what you look like when you do it, because it, it does, it can look bizarre. I mean, some people do voices just by manipulating their, their face, like their mouth or whatever, like they'll stick their mouth out like this, you know what I mean? <laughs> or they'll like, you know, bring it back here, you know? So I, it just, it really, really depends. And, and you just have to be like open with it and try different things until you, they, you get the sound that they like and that works for them. And you mentioned something earlier, Richard, that um, with the screaming, a lot of times on these shows, there is a lot of like yelling and thumping and you know sound effects. And for that, that's, that's called like the wall of sheet. And we have to do three different times, like say like, like ow, 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 <laughs> right? And you have to keep doing it or scream or whatever. And we usually keep that till the end of the show because you can lose your voice from screaming or it doesn't matter how much you warm up. It's, sometimes it's just really hard on your vocal cords. So, yeah. Cool. Thank yeah. you very much. Welcome. Hello. Uh, my question is, uh, I've got two things to say. First of all, have you also found that uh, sort of commercial venues, for example, doing voiceovers for commercials, doing them for corporate training videos. Has that been, and do you think it is, a, uh, an option to at least get work and experience in voice acting? Sure. Oh, yeah. Doesn't make any difference. Our voice is our voice, and we do the best we can, no matter what it, the uh, venue Yeah, we do, we do straight stuff as well as doing animation. I mean, I did 10 years of doing Tonight on NBC, you know. And, well, that was me and a couple of other guys, but, I mean, we all sounded alike, you know. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, you know, anything. We did, remember, Trey, did you work for Trey Tech? No, I never have. Trey Tech was an uh, organ. Do you know anybody there? <laughs> it's, it's gone. They were so good that they did put themselves out of business, but they, they did uh, business learning books for people like IBM. Oh. That's and exactly what I was thinking was that those type of things. Uh, yeah, we did a lot I, of those. I actually do writing and my stuff is, is for the professional environment. I really haven't written anything you know, for pleasure that's fiction in quite some time. I was just good at it and fell into it. And I do have a suggestion for you, uh, Richard. Uh, Dick. Dick, yeah. Dick, if you are going to, to, like Venus, make a story about going to Venus, make your story about going to Washington, D.C., as there are a lot of dicks there. <laughs> uh, very good. Dick Cheney, for one. Yeah. <laughs> Big dick. <laughs> Hello, my question is for all three of you. Um, during your careers, was there ever a time in which uh, you auditioned for a role or a, or a job, and, and that uh, you tur it turned out to be something that uh, you were glad you never got, or were there was something that you were uh, very regretful that you never got? Well, I think every job we're turned down for were regretful. We're regretful. <laughs> I have to agree with you on that. And, yeah. I mean, you want to win everything. You do. You know, and the, obviously you can't win everything. Uh, and, and that brings up a point that I always like to mention, particularly to young actors, is that uh, you you have a ratio. Uh, at some point, you win. What, let's say it's one out of ten. That becomes your ratio. Uh, so uh, you can change that by by taking classes or doing other things. But if that's your ratio, you you can't expect to get more than one out of ten. But the faster you can get through the nine that aren't yours, the quicker you get to the one that is. So 
every time you don't get one, that's a step closer to yours, so it's a win. Instead of you experiencing it as, as a loss, mm. it's, it becomes a, a factor in getting you closer to the one that's yours. You know, the thing that always bothered me was that older actors would tell young actors that, oh, the rejection in this business is terrible. And it's non-existent. That's not the game. If we are advertising agency people and we're going to hire Santa Claus, we ask, send us 10 Santa Claus. Send the best Santa Clauses in the world. We don't say send us weak Santa Claus. We say mm -hmm. the best. So here are 10 wonderful, jolly old elves to come before us. We can only choose one. That's the game. So for that show, that day, for us, we choose one who is then the best. If nine of them walk away and say, I lost a good one, they lied. They didn't lose anything. They never had it to lose. It was only theirs to win. So if you walk around with a whole bag of losses, then you're going to be weighted down and eventually you'll just give up. Uh, so you can't regard it as a loss. It, you had an opportunity that 150,000 other members of Screen Actors Guild didn't get that day. And, and so that was a win. Every, you were chosen because you're one of the best. That's a validation. So it's, it's a matter of changing your whole attitude about the game. And uh, I've written a wonderful book. That's what I was just going to tell them. Uh, Jack, I was just going to tell them Shameless that. Shameless plug. It's How to Succeed in Voiceovers Without Ever Losing by Jack Angel. Come up and get a free uh, uh, bookmark when the thing is over here. And uh, there's no obligation. It'll, the how, book is a $9 do you, how do you book. get it? Do you go online? Yeah, you can go to my website or you can go to Abbott Press or, you know, whatever. But uh, he, he was right about, about the attitude. For instance, uh, I read for your role, yeah. Venus, <laughs> and I didn't get it, and I was so pissed. I, I, you know. He went home and got, climbed back in his spider web and said, <laughs> why didn't I get that? But it's an interesting question because, you know, prior to auditioning, you know, you really, like, like anything, I mean, you're going there to win. You're going there because you know you're the best person for that job and, you know, there's nothing that can stand in your way except for, you know, like 20 other actors. But uh, it's, just, it's just part of the game and it's just, you know, the way it is. But what's interesting is, like, when you're doing a show, like, say, like, Beast Wars, we didn't have very many incidental characters, but on other shows we have you know, where you're doing like a, you know, regular character, there's times where like, you know, a little character here pops up or there and there's, you know, a few of us in the room and we're all vying for that little extra job, right? And that can be fun and competitive and to see what people come up with. So that's kind of exciting. And, and again, you know, it keeps you on your toes and, and you know, it, it, you're not so comfortable. Oh, I've got my job. I've got my part. I'm just going to just, you know, it's like you're constantly trying to come up with new things and new voices and, and stuff to, to compete right? To, to keep you in the game, basically. Yeah. You all know who uh, Peter Laurie was? He, mm. you know, in Casablanca, you know, the little Weasley guy. Well, I was in a session one time, and, and there were like eight, ten actors, two women, and the guy said, who does Peter Laurie? And everybody, including <laughs> the two women, everybody did Peter Laurie. <laughs> 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 Trying to vie for it. I don't remember who won it. doesn't matter, but yeah. everybody tried. Yeah. I think it was Peter Lord Jr. <laughs> said, I have to go out and choke my car. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Oh, God. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, Hello. hi. Hello. <laughs> hi. Hi, Goober. Uh, hey, what's up? Hi, Goober. You know, that you're just two letters away from being a booger. <laughs> I don't know. No one figures that out. <laughs> I used to watch you on TV. I oh. thought you was real good. <laughs> okay, ready, guys? Yeah. Mm. I'm going to put you in an unlikely scenario. Uh oh. Okay. Okay. Rod uh, Rodimus Prime, Ultra Magnus, and Black Arachnia yes. have, have just, have just uh, pulled off a, a, a diamond heist. Um, they have <laughs> robbed, like, you know, the crown jewels. They're on the run in a high-speed vehicle chase from the authorities. Uh, and, and, and in the middle of this high-speed uh, white-knuckle chase, uh, one of you decides to stop for ice cream at a Dairy Queen. <laughs> Go. Which character am I? I don't know. <laughs> 
<laughs> ultra Magnus. Oh, Optimus Ultra. Prime, Good old Black Ultra. Yeah. 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 I feel like an ice cream cone. Yeah. No, I don't yeah. think so. Maybe I, Astro Train. Oh, yeah, you Astro know what Train. I like? I like Rocky Road. Does anyone here like Rocky Road? Rocky Road. Well, I, I've never knew her. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more. Will you two imbeciles shut up and move it? How do you know I'm an imbecile? <laughs> Are we supposed to do it in character, right? Yeah, yeah, in character. Are you guys not yeah, yeah. playing along? Where do we get, Gary? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and, and have we stopped and then we go? Is that yeah. it? You know, <laughs> I'll tell you, Goober, what you're asking us to do is something we never do. No. We always have a script. Oh. We don't, we uh, don't, uh, we don't ad lib stuff. I mean, we do ad lib stuff when we're we screwing around yeah, with a script. Within the context but, that's already established. But we, we, don't, we don't fly on our own. We're not, uh, <laughs> you know. Really? Yeah. You, can't, you can't deal with it. Too much pressure. That's not that. It's, no, it's not that. We don't want that. to. <laughs> <laughs> Why should we? That's cool. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> I get big bucks for doing stuff like that, man. <laughs> Anybody else have any other questions? Now's the time. Yeah, that isn't name Goober. <laughs> so my question is, I see you used to have great chemistry, obviously friends for years now. How often do you make friendships with people you've worked with that last long beyond the TV show? Like, for example, Venus, do you still talk to the people from the Beast Wars era occasionally? I do. Do you I, talk to other G1 actors? I'm hoping to have a long-term relationship with Venus. I just met her. <laughs> <laughs> and we're well, both I'm Greek. first. <laughs> That's I, right. <laughs> I only hang out with movie stars. <laughs> 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 no, you know, you make a few friends along the way, and, and some, 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 sometimes it it clicks, you know, off microphone, and sometimes it doesn't, mm -hmm. and, uh, and you try, and sometimes you fail, and, and sometimes it, it hangs on, or else you'll see them just once in a while, and, and that's enough. Well, you, you go in different directions, too, you know? I mean, in your career, you, it, some people gravitate toward television, some go to the movies, some go home, you know? And, and uh, so, I mean, our relationship is based on working in cartoons, and if we're not working in cartoons, we don't see each other. And uh, so, uh, and, and we never, very seldom did we ever have personal relationships beyond work. Um, and we're all gypsies, you know, we go where the work is. Yeah, we're voice whores. <laughs> <laughs> It's a little, well, except for it, it's you. a little different, except for me. I yeah, know. <laughs> it's a little different in Vancouver because uh, you know we don't have as much work um, as they do uh, probably in LA or the US. But uh, I, I've worked like for instance with Scott McNeil on lots of cartoon shows, but I've also worked with him on screen as well. Um, same with Gary Chalk um, and David Kay. You know what I mean? So so it's different. It's like you know a lot of these guys just do voice, but a lot of them branch into other parts, you know, like theater and, and film and TV as well. So it's a little different um, in Vancouver. But yeah, we, we keep friendships. And a lot of the times, it's not so much that we see each other often. It's we'll see each other auditions or, or say at a party or at an opening or something like that. And it's always, um, it's always nice when we do see each other because, you know, when we've worked together on a project for, you know, X amount of episodes, and it's usually, you know, 60 or more, uh, you do build, you know, some kind of, you know, com camaraderie and, and closeness, and you get to know each other, and it's fun. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. Hi. Uh, I'm just curious. Do you guys have any kind of uh, methodology for remembering what a particular character would sound like, like, long after the fact? Because you guys do so many different voices. Um, I was just wondering if there's a way you keep track of, you know, what a particular character sounded like. Well, for me, uh, I mean, if I have a copy of it, and I'm going to go back and do that two years later, I'll listen to what I did two years ago. Sometimes, if they're smart, they have a copy of it. So when I go in, they'll say, here's what you did two years ago, and then I can reconnect with it. 
Absolutely. Uh, yeah. and, and, and then there are other times you go in and do it, and they'll say, that's not quite right. I said, well, what did I do? Well, make it lower, make it higher, make it this, make it that. Oh, okay, yeah. And, and sometimes it clicks in, you know. Great. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Is that your natural hair color? No. no uh, uh, I thought maybe it just grew that way. <laughs> My question is, um, is there any role out there that you haven't had a chance to play yet that would be your dream role to play? Well, Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> a dream role. Yeah, I think it's a case-by-case scenario depending on the project depending on the story um, are you talking animation or or any anything anything really but specifically animation like has there ever been like a character that you loved as a kid that you were like if I could you know play the part of this character that would be you know fun mm. I think we kind of do that it's like if if uh, if they ask for a, a, a character a little Weasley character I will do my best Peter Lorre you know, yes, <laughs> of course, Rick, I need the letters of transit, you know. <laughs> and, and uh, uh, yes, that's right, sweetheart, I'll, uh, I've got them here in my, in my valise. No, oh no, this is a Jack Angel thing. Uh, y you know, I can be all those characters. Yes, sir. I mean, if, and, I, if, and we, if, if I could be any of the Mel Blanc characters, I would love it. Right. I'd just like to get Mel Blanc's money. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. And oh. just thank you again, um, Venus, for all your work. And thank you for making me love Jean Grey as well in awesome. X-Men Evolution. And I look forward to seeing uh, you, Mr. Gaudier, in uh, Robin Hood. I love Robin Hood, so I'm looking oh, forward yeah, to checking that, out that that's new That's been re-released, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. called When Things Were Rotten, if anyone uh, you remembers. I don't, we'll yeah. see. <laughs> it, was just, it was just released last <laughs> week. thank you all for week. coming again. Thank you for having us. It's so sweet. Uh oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi guys, and gal. Um, was there ever a role that you didn't get that got away that you really wish you got? Something that you were like, oh man, I really hope I get that one. Uh, you never I, got it. But now like, again, are you talking animation? Any or? Any, any any voiceover oh, work in general? And, oh, any voiceover work? Um, yes. I uh, auditioned for and didn't get the Budweiser account and uh, as a voiceover. And it just happened that my wife's brother's best friend was the creative on that account in New York. And he came to L.A. and uh, we took him to the Ivy, a very upscale restaurant, and we were having lunch. And he said, oh, by the way, you auditioned for the Budweiser account. Do you know how close you came to getting it? And I said, no. And he took my coffee cup and he went. And I said, uh, really? He said, yeah, there were eight guys in the room. Seven of them wanted you. And one guy wanted Danny Dark. Danny won because the guy who wanted Danny was the boss. Oh, my gosh. He said, now you want to know how much money you didn't make? Oh. And, and my wife said, no. <laughs> and I said, yes. And he said, well, Darren McGavin had the account for several years prior. He had a million dollar guarantee per year and every year he exceeded the guarantee. He said, that's how much you didn't make. Wow. That's one that got away and that one was, you know, a retirement maker. That was a, wow. uh, that was a home in Malibu. Well, we have a home in Malibu, but. The, <laughs> that, was, that was a bigger home in Malibu. <laughs> it, it would, yeah, it would have been a, a much bigger home in Malibu. The uh, one I lost was for uh, Jack in the Box. Yeah. Oh. A lot of guys read for the voice of Jack in the Box. And I was about, with about five or six guys, because he was kind of like a smart ass character. So it was good for me because I played a lot of those guys. <laughs> you know. Not even acting for you. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and anyway, I did not get it. And we found out who got it was the guy who created oh, yeah. the, the, whole, the whole The guy project. that does the voice of Jack. Yeah, is, he, is the creative on it, and he put yeah. himself on it, and and he, and made a million dollars. Yeah, yeah. Because now there, there was another holiday. guy that did Lexi. What was his name? Uh, Rich Richard. Uh, oh God, uh, Lexus ca came out, and there was one guy. Did, oh no, 
see it now with your Lexus dealer. Oh, right, right. He did that for years. Uh, and uh, uh, he was the only guy that ever did it. And then they decided they want to go a different direction. And they did for about a month. And they didn't like what they did. And they went back. But this guy, in the meantime, had taken uh, a job as doing announcing for Mitsubishi, which was kind of like you will go from Lexus to Mitsubishi. But what are you trying to kill your career? <laughs> and, and, and they wanted to go back to him. But he'd already had now uh, Mitsubishi, so they couldn't. So they hired uh, Maurice LaMarche. And Maurice LaMarche is currently the voice of Lexus. Yeah. And he sounds pretty much the same as uh, the other guy did. You Maurice know? LaMarche is amazing, you know? Yeah. He does uh, Orson Welles. I mean, God. Well, yeah, does. I always call him Mr. Welles when I see him. <laughs> <laughs> he's, really, he's really wonderful. I, I met him down in L.A., and he came up to me and introduced himself, and he said, we're both from Canada. And I said, well, I'm sort of from Canada. And, uh, and he said, well, I've, I've come down to, to try to become a, a voice actor. <laughs> and about three years later, he was beating me out of everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, he's brilliant. Yeah, he is. He and, and Frank Welker. My, my dream job would be uh, prime time, 8 p.m. time slot, Simpsons, 20-year run. Um, that yeah. would be my dream job yeah. because it's so much fun doing voice work, uh, especially when you work with a great group of people, and and they probably make a hell of a lot more money than we make doing our oh, voice. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it, it's just huge, and and to be part of something like that would be a dream come true. You know, you know, we're we're in it for the money. We're in it, <laughs> we're in it for the fun of it. For the fun and we're, the money. because we enjoy it, but we're also in it for the money. Hmm. And like you know, and, and right. a, another dream job. I I, ha, I did NBC promos for ten years, but the primary guy at NBC at that time was Danny Dark, the guy that beat me out for the Budweiser account. Mm. But he was a he was a you good. You don't guy. like that guy, do you? No, he was a good. Guy. He was a really good guy, and uh, he's now taking a dirt nap. But he. Uh, <laughs> 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 that answers that. I don't think so. But, he, but Danny had the, NB, the primary NBC account for 10 years, more than 10 years, I guess, 15 years. And uh, he was getting a million dollars a year just for going in and doing, you know, tonight on NBC and whatever the promos That's were. Amazing. And he bought a house in Malibu, M oh, Mucho Grande, a wonderful house, on the water, two stories. Lindsay Wagner lived downstairs. He rented the downstairs to her, and he lived upstairs. And Lindsay had a dog that used to crap on the beach. <laughs> and, he, and, and he couldn't stand that. And he also, Danny, played the trumpet. And he would play the trumpet, and Lindsay would call him and say, Danny, I have an early call. I can't, I, can you please not play the trumpet? And so Danny decided he didn't want to have anybody living in his house. So when Lindsay's... Uh, uh, lease was up. He didn't renew it, and he created the whole house, a two-story house. He lived in the bedroom, the living room that was upstairs, made it into a bedroom, and it was a great place. But he did that was, you know, on on the residuals, not the residuals, but on the on the session fees mm -hmm. for doing promos for 12, 15 years at NBC. Uh, I, I mean, I made, uh, I guess, about 150 grand a year just doing pickup stuff, you know, uh, and the stuff that Danny was too lazy to come back from Malibu to do. Mm. And, uh, and there was another guy that was ahead of me. He, uh, this guy uh, made a, a half a million bucks a year doing the stuff Danny didn't want to come back to do. And I got, I started doing the Tonight Show promos when Carson was on. They had never promoted the Carson show. And once they did, the ratings went up. Gee, big surprise. Interesting. So they wanted to do it all the time. And this, this second guy, Jerry, he begged off. He said, it's my dinner time when we have to do that. And I, I, I don't want to have to come in and do it. Can, we, can you get somebody else? So the guy called my agent, and my agent started listing off guys. And he got to me, and he said, oh, we know Jack. And he's OK. So that's how I got 10 years on NBC. We know Jack. He's OK. Wow. And, and, and I went in to do the Tonight Show every every night, and then they'd say, "Well, there's there's some other stuff that we need, so when you're through here, go into the big room and do that." So it was ten years, and uh, 
So they didn't pre-record. You had to go in every night to to, every night. to sit yeah. to mention the guests and stuff and who was on the show. I guess. Yeah. Interesting. And and in <laughs> fact, they didn't have a producer uh, assigned to that show to Tonight Show. And so they would sort of like whoever was available, and nobody wanted to do it uh, of the producers. They they just oh, I don't want to do it. And I'd say okay. Just relax, and I I knew what was going on, so I would kind of re write the show and <laughs> pick out the little pieces that should be in the promo. So for mm. for th three years uh, that Carson was still on, uh, I did uh, I did the Tonight Show promos and pretty much created them myself. Mm -hmm. cool. And of course, we're all friends with Michael Bell. Oh yes, yeah. and Michael, Michael Bell is famous for having walked down a hall one day. And uh, some producer said, oh, Michael, come in here. And he said, what? And he said, say butter. And he went, butter. He said, well, no, it sound made it, made it a different sound. And he went, butter. So he said, okay, good. Oh. So he got it, and, uh, <laughs> and that bought him a house in Malibu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it was, it was Fess Parker's oh. house in the, uh, <laughs> on the, you know, on the water in, in Santa Barbara. Montequilla. And, and uh, he, Michael bought it with the residuals from saying butter parquet. And, and he called it Casa de los Residuales. <laughs> <laughs> the house of residuals. So but, it does happen, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a major, major, I mean, you know, everybody fell into all this stuff. Yeah. You know, somebody liked somebody. And, and when I tell young people who want to get into the business, you really only have to find one person who falls in love with what you do. Yeah, be likable. And, I mean, the guy that hired Danny for 15 years just was John Miller. He said, I, I, I don't want to hear you on anybody's network but mine. Hmm. And so Danny said, okay, it's going to cost you. And he said, fine. You know, Ernie Anderson did ABC for longer than that. He's yeah, the guy that, he's the, Ernie's the guy that said the promos were on the love boat. And uh, I mean, he had a wonderful set of pipes and he did a lot of other stuff and he was knocking down a million bucks a year doing promos, you know? And, and those are great accounts. I would have loved to have had two or three of those. Don LaFontaine, who just passed away a couple of years ago, uh, also did a, a ton of promos and trailers and things. And he had a limo and he used to drive from job to job. And he told me one time, he said, I've, I've hit four million a year just doing voiceovers. And he says, I can't go past that because I spent too goddamn much time in the limo. <laughs> and, and finally, he set up a, a house, a studio in his house to where he had a ISDN line and he didn't have to go anywhere. He could then just record from his house. He did mostly movie trailers. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Jaws. Oh, no, that was Percy. Well, anyway, yeah. Percy Rodriguez. You know who Percy Rodriguez was? Is he that guy he, in a time? He, he was the light heavyweight. <laughs> in a place. Percy was the light heavyweight champion of Canada, no. and uh, hit oh, his huge know. hands. Yeah. And he was a sweet, sweet man, and uh, he adored my wife <laughs> <laughs> in a, in a friendly way. Uh, but uh, he uh, he called her. He called her. He said, uh, "She's my baby." And I said, yeah. He said, yeah. I understand you're marrying my baby. And I said, yes, I am, Percy. He said, okay, I just want to say one thing to you. If I ever hear in any way that you're mean to her, I'm going to come and kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> and I Coming said, okay. to a theater near you. I got it, Percy. So we were, we were going to throw a party about a year later, and we called him, and he didn't answer. He was, his, his machine picked up. And uh, she called again. Machine picked up. So, uh, and Arlene was saying, uh, yeah, a person, give me a call back, give me a call back. So finally, when he got back from Canada, he called. He said, what's the matter? Does he mean to you? You want me to kick his ass? <laughs> <laughs> no, Percy, we want to invite you to a party. <laughs> he really wanted to kick my ass. <laughs> I know that feeling. <laughs> All right, thank you, guys. Uh, thanks thanks you guys. for coming. Are we done? So... Come and get your bookmarks. Anybody yes, who get wants the bookmarks. Them.